Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Euro Nurse. We meet every Saturday. If you're watching us on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, welcome to the show. For those YouTubers out there, please be sure to hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get our subscription base up. And if this is your first time watching our show, be sure to check us out on Euronurse.com where you can learn more about the show. It's also the best place to go to catch all of our past episodes, 61 of them now. Hey, if you want to listen to us in your car, we have our audio podcast available on our Euronurse Plus part of the website. Just click that. It'll bring you over there, and you can select whichever your favorite format is for listening on in your car. And for those of you that aren't getting our newsletter, Go ahead to the website and fill that out. We'll be glad to send you a newsletter every week. Every Monday it comes out. Also, today's going to be an interactive meeting. So for those of you that are watching live, be sure to put your questions into the box so that we know um, we can get those. We can read those out loud. I'm going to ask a few questions during this particular talk. So I want to get your feedback. And hey, we got Arizona coming up the October 26th through the 29th. Your owners will be live at the Eurologic meeting. Hope to meet a lot of you at the meeting. So come by and maybe you can be on the show. So this, I said, this week is going to be interactive. I'm going to be giving the talk on urology imaging. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did have a, a request for that and we do like to try to honor requests. So if you've got a program or something you're interested in, be sure to let us know. Um, but this is going to be interactive. So feel free to put your information anytime on those comment boxes. And now let's bring in our experts. We got a great group today. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good welcome, morning. Welcome to the show. I know uh, John's coming from us remotely. Where are you at, John? I'm in Alabama, believe it or not. Wow. So, uh, better time zone this time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> except, except it's two hours ahead of Arizona time. What you're used to. Well, as long as I got you on the screen, John, go ahead and give an introduction. Well, hello everyone. My name is John. I'm a private practice urologist, usually in Gilbert, Arizona, which is also just a little bit south of Phoenix. And I'm extremely fortunate in that I've been uh, enjoying what I do in urology so much so that I now get to share my clinical and business experience with other urologists. And actually that's what I'm doing here today. Later on this afternoon, I'll be speaking to a group of urologists on how to run your practices uh, successfully and efficiently. And one of the ways that I'm doing that also is virtually by creating and running the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. It is free and there are over well, 2,300 U.S.-based urology folks in that group. And I look forward to collaborating with all of you. Feel free to join. Back to you, Vic. Yeah, thank you. And Lori, go ahead and give us your introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Atkinson. I'm a certified urology registered nurse. I've been working in urology for 25 years. Currently work for Northwestern uh, Memorial at uh, Del Nor in Geneva and Central DuPage Hospital in Winfield. Happy to be here. All right. No interesting uh, stories today, huh? You know, I was going to bring up this, this one story that I had that was really interesting last week. And this has never happened in 25 years that I've, I've been in urology. We had a patient come in and of course, you know, their bag is leaking. We get that a million times, just change the bag out and be on your way. Well, after that, he came back the same day because his catheter fell out. Weird, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, who knows? Maybe he nicked it, the, the port, who knows? So the nurse had changed it and he leaves. And a few hours later, he comes back because it falls out again. Now, I literally asked this guy, I said, are you doing something with this port? <laughs> Is there like, and he brought them in. So I blew up the balloon on the second one that fell out, left it there for two hours. Nothing happened to it. Nothing. I'm like, how in the way he swears up and down. He didn't change it and you know some people were like well maybe did he have any devices in did he have a Eurolift? maybe something poked but that balloon stayed intact for two hours afterwards nothing happened to it so i'm still floored on what this could have been crazy wow. okay so yeah. it remains a mystery it remains a mystery wow well if anybody has a comment out there yeah. it's an unsolved <laughs> mystery of the catheter that fell out on its own twice you know, to put that in <laughs> twice yeah 
All righty. And I'm Vic Sinise. I'm the host and I'm going to be the speaker for today. Um, I've got an interesting fact here. Hey, October is Italian American Heritage Month. You didn't know that about me? I'm Italian. So I think it's important, no matter what your heritage is, to celebrate your history. One of the ways that I think tradition or things are passed on is through traditions. Now, my grandma was a fantastic cook and she made all the favorite Italian recipes. And the nice thing about grandma is she always let us come up to the table with her and she'd give us the dough to roll out and do something. Really kind of got me into cooking. So I uh, really kind of give my credit to my grandma for being uh, as good a cook as I am. And I like to pass down those traditions. So here's my little granddaughter. This is Olivia. And she's getting ready to give grandpa a hand making some apple pie. So we did do that, came out delicious, and again, passing on the traditions. The reason I bring that up is I think urology is almost like a nationality. We're all kind of as a group together in the study of urology. So I welcome all of us to give that same back to the traditions. So eh, well, Vic, that's your well, own nurse. Well, Vic, traditions are good most of the time. But in urology, there has been so many advances and changes we should not fall prey to status quo bias. And this phrase you've heard numerous times, probably at different meetings, at different offices, and that is, we do it this way because that's the way we've always done it. Absolutely. So always be careful of status quo bias, challenge dogma, always ask, is this the best way? And also, what can I do to make this better? Yep. I can't disagree with that at all, but it's always good to have some of that tradition to fall back on. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and bring in our show. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do this as an interactive meeting. I got to make a few. Well, let's see. That's not the one I wanted. That's the one I wanted. All right. Now, as you may or may not be noticing, I'm switching over to my other microphone and my other computer. So, hey, how's everybody doing? All right. Now we're going to make this good. interactive. Good. All right. So I wanted to be able to try something different. So I've got two cameras going, and I'm going to be talking to you about urology imaging. And I can do a little bit of writing on my tablet here. So first question is, why do we even care? You know, you just read the radiology reports, and that should be sufficient, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, not always, because as you can see, here's a radiology report. And in the report, they mentioned a mass in the right kidney, but in the impression, it said left kidney. Is it right? Is it left? I don't think too many urologists could get away with a, in a court of law saying, well, that's what the radiology report said. Of course, you have to be able to know a little bit at least about looking at these films and how to interpret them and make sure that the reports are at least correct. Now, our guys do great jobs, our radiologists, but uh, they're human too. Now, going back the very first uh, film I'm going to talk about is something called a KUB. And I'm going to pose this one for the audience. Can you tell me what a KUB stands for? Go ahead and put it in the comments. I'm going to go through a few things and then we'll see what your uh, results are. Um, but anyway, it, the KUB is a plain x-ray. We can see organ outlines, soft tissues, stomach and bowel gas, um, and many of the bones that are present which means I think it's a good time to do a short little review of anatomy and some of the structures I think are important that you're focusing on. Um, we always use the spine, spinal cord as a reference point, and the kidneys tend to fall between L3 and T12. And for those of you that remember your anatomy, you know, we, we label from top to bottom. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, so these bony anatomies are kind of important because sometimes you might want to refer to a stone that's over here and you would say it's adjacent to L3. And the ureters run right along the spinal cord, kind of convenient. The other thing in anatomy is the kidneys are not at the same level. The right kidney is a little bit lower than the left. And the reason for that is because we got this big old liver sitting up here pushing down on it. We know how the kidneys look. They're what we're looking at on x-ray is the kidney and the ureters and the collecting system. On top of the kidney is the adrenal gland. They're surrounded by fat and drosha's fascia. Um, but that's the basics. We can see the renal artery and the renal vein coming off of it. This is all the information that we'll be looking at when we review these slides. 
Um, big thing about the uh, vascular system, the two main pipes that go through us, the vena cava and the aorta, are sitting right next to the kidneys. They've got a direct line. So they're not getting their blood from a garden hose. They're getting it from a, a fire hydrant. So lots of blood coming through. And the last thing I'm going to review is uh, muscle structure. And that's because this big muscle here on the back called the psoas muscle is often a, another landmark that you can see on x-ray. Um, it's the kidney sit right in, in, right, right in front of it. So here we go. Here's our first film. And this is a KUB. So we can see all of our bony structure. There's our spinal cord. Here's our pelvis. And then this is a post uh, shockwave patient. And there's a stent in place. Um, first thing I want to point out here is that L that says left. So if you're new to reading x-rays, that's on the right side of the film. The left side of the film is over here. And why is that? Well, if we remember the way an x-ray is shot, there's a film or now a sensor used behind the patient. So it's being shot through the patient. So this is the left hand. That's the right hand. And that's the reason that's labeled uh, as left and right. So always tradition, I'll always know that your right side is going to be over here. Your left will be over there. So it's a left sided stent. And if we look at the stent right here, we can kind of see this area. And those are some stones that had formed on the stent. Hey, Lori, do we have anybody that had an answer for what KUB stood for? It looks pretty unanimous. Kidney, urine, or bladder. All right. I didn't fool the audience. I always <laughs> like to have a good, strong audience. Uh, yeah. And I, I, for the longest time, I just kept saying KUB, KUB without even knowing what it stood for. The next uh, test that we were talking before the show started, it's probably not done very often, but uh, if you've been in urology for 40 years, like I have, You've seen plenty of these IVP. That's the X plane X-ray with the addition of dye. <clears throat> the dye that they use is iodine contrast, which means that we have to be careful that the patient isn't allergic to the dye, that the patient's renal function is okay. Because if the patient has an abnormal renal function and you give them dye, you could actually cause renal. Uh, it, you could actually cause renal failure in a patient. So very important things about that. Also, the bowel sits in front of the, the, the kidneys, so if there's a lot of stool that could block the view and you're giving them dye and putting them through the x-rays, always make sure you do a bowel prep ahead of time. So let's take a quick look here at what our IVP looks like. So we did our plain film, and now this is after the dye is given. So we can see the kidneys are starting to shine better because they're picking up the dye and from the bloodstream. That dye is injected through the bloodstream through an IV. And then, of course, it's concentrated by the kidneys, so we see a nice uh, outline of the collecting system. We can see that these little cup shapes here for the calyces look nice and normal. We can see the ureter all the way down to the bladder. And again, this is our right side. This is our left side. Um, and again, we can see here's our spinal cord that we could kind of make references to where things are at. So now, before you shoot an X-ray, uh, an IVP, and give the dye, you always take plain films like the KUB. And here's one of those KUBs. And if you just looked at it at a, at a glance without knowing what's going on here, you might say, okay, nice picture of the spinal cord. Well, that's because I was cutting out an arrow that's pointing out what's going on. So once we deliver the dye, we can see that the dye comes all the way down to here, and then it stops. So we know that there's something... At, and if and if we kind of label this as L5 and L4, we know at the top of L4, there's something going on there. And when we go over to our previous, our prior one, we can go to the same point. We see that that was actually a stone. So stone was causing the lack of dye to come down. So the combination of having a dye study along with the previous un, uh, no study, you know, no contrast is what's important. Now, in an IVP, it does something called tomograms, which are slices through the kidneys. And that's done by the machine actually doing a sweeping motion with the x-ray tube. So the x-ray tube moves from right to left, and it kind of blurs everything else out, but focuses on the kidneys. And you get these nice slices, kind of like a CAT scan, only they're sagittal instead of transverse uh, views. Um, and you can see this is labeled 10 centimeters. This one is at 11 centimeters. So it takes one centimeter cuts through the kidneys. 
It really reveals a lot of information that way. Uh, they're not done very often anymore. And we were kind of kidding because probably most people don't even know how to do it. And I don't even know the equipment still exists, but the, uh, they they took forever. You know, every time it took a slice, it was probably a, a two or three minute ordeal. So CAT scans, we all know a spiral CT can give you the same information much more quickly. Um, so here's our other thing. That's a factor that you want to keep in mind is when you're doing them, you're going to have to get delayed films. So the delayed films, because when we see this, we don't see anything here. And is there an absent kidney? Well, I can see a kidney shadow. Um, remember, we did talk about the psoas muscle. You can see that right over there and there. But now we look at their delay film and what's going on here. Well, it's an obstructed kidney. We can see that this is ballooning out and those calyces are not so sharp anymore. We can also see the dyes collecting here in the bladder. Now, remember, this other kidney is functioning normally. Here's a picture of an IVP with the dye in the bladder. And when we can see that there's this, what we call a filling defect. Anytime you see that, you have to wonder what's going on. Now, of course, this patient went in for cystoscopy and turned out to have a, a tumor there. This is another interesting one. This is a ureter. And when you look at this, it looks like a goblet. Kind of that's a wine goblet. And this is called the goblet sign. So when you see a filling defect, like you see right here in the ureter, it could be a kidney stone. When you see this goblet sign, the high suspicion then should be a ureteral tumor. And indeed, that's what this patient had was a ureteral tumor. We have a tomogram here, or I mean, the IVP, and we can see this big filling defect here in the kidneys also. And that turned out to also be a tumor. Now, patients could be allergic to the dye, could have bad renal function, and you're unable to do an IVP. The other option is to do a retrograde pilogram, and that's where a dye is injected up the ureters to fill out the collecting system. And that looks like this. So cystoscopically, we see the scope right there. And then these stents are placed inside the ureters. And then dye is injected in reverse. And it fills those out nicely. The nice thing is even if they're allergic to the dye, you can still do a retrograde pilogram because it's not getting into the blood system and they don't have to worry about allergic reactions or renal failure because, again, it's not being filtered by the kidneys. Now, of course, it doesn't highlight anything in the kidneys because it's not getting into the bloodstream. Another study that we, we do is something called avoiding cystourethrogram. Um, that's where you fill up the bladder through the, the urethra and take a look at it, often voiding. This is done under fluoroscopy. Um, that's what it looks like. So you can kind of see for issues that with the bladder. You can get a nice look at the bladder, how it's filling. You can actually have them um, micturate while you're doing the study and kind of see as, as the sphincter opening while they're doing it. Often done with uh, video urodynamics. We're looking for uh, big steric dysfunction where the sphincter shuts when it should be opening as the bladder is squeezing. Um, but these are things that we look at with this particular study. I can tell you that I did do a few of those back early on, and it's, it's a mess. It's it's a tough study to do because you're asking a patient to void while they're sitting on a fluoroscopy or standing on a fluoroscopy table and just collecting it in a bunch of towels and stuff. So it's really probably not done too often. I don't know, John, you could, have you ordered any uh, cystograms at all recently? or it's It's rare because I don't see a lot of, uh, pediatric patients where yeah. that is a lot more common. Yes. The other thing that we do is retrograde your ure uh, urethrograms. Um, and that's where you actually take the dye and you insert it. You can see this is the tip of the guy's penis. And then the dye goes back and that's to assess for strictures inside the urethra or any other malformations that could be there. Um, now here's another interesting thing. Comments. Put in what do you think this is? What do you call it? What's going on here? I'm going to give you a couple of clues while you're putting your information in here. But um, so if we look at anytime I look at an x-ray, the nice thing is you can always compare right to left. So if something's going on in the one side, you can look at the normal side. So this is the right side. Here's the femur. And here's the where the femoral head is. And this capsule looks nice and normal. We look over here and see that is disrupted right there. You can kind of see that on the film. Um, 
the pelvis bones are not really lining up where they should. And then here's the femur itself, and we can see that there's a femoral fracture. So the big hint here is this patient was in a car accident. Now, Lori, did we get any uh, information, any, any suggestions on what that could be? Nope, haven't received anything. Okay, now it goes to the experts. What's going on here? I'll, I'll go with Lori Sorry, first. Lori. Oh, here, yeah. well, okay, so Susie Swain said, of course, a pelvic fracture. Pelvic fracture, yep. But what's so this? Stuff? My guess, here's my guess. It's got to be some kind of rupture, correct? Yep. So yeah. that's extravasation. Um, I think I call it like, it looks like clouds to me. And here we can see the bladder up here. So we know that there's a disruption between the two. So yeah, because of a pelvic fracture, there was a uh, disruption and extravasation of the dye. Really nice study for that. As soon as you put that up, I was going to ask you how fast was he going? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Too, too, the answer to that is too fast. <laughs> yeah. so I think that was a motorcycle to... accident too. This, this guy was a wreck. The, uh, I, I took care of him and he, uh, he said that the, the road rash was the worst part. Mm. He actually said that was the thing that made me wish I almost that I died. He said the pain of going through the skin grafting and all that. So don't they I'm... see, don't, uh, for pelvic or for bladder ruptures, isn't it most common in, in car accidents? It is. Patients it is more hold ladders or yeah. deceleration yeah. injuries. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next thing I'm going to talk about is ultrasound. Ultrasound uses high frequency sound waves. No radiation involved in it. No dyes involved in it. Um, it's just strictly bouncing off uh, sound waves. And we can see a lot of things such as dilated collecting systems, stones, uh, areas that aren't showing up. And this is our ultrasound figure here and ultrasound is really tech dependent you have to have a technologist who knows what they're doing because you're the one finding that organ and kind of getting the pictures there we can kind of see that it's showing some cysts that it's marking out here on this but it's really tech dependent you, you can't just uh, give the pictures without knowing the reference of where they're at so but you can still diagnose quite a bit through ultrasound and here's a still shot so we can see a little stone formation. Sto things that are hard or solid look white, and things that are liquid are black on the ultrasound. Again, here's our cyst, nice clear cyst. And you can measure those. So how do we compare CT versus renal for uh, looking at cyst? And we can see this is what a CT would look like for the cyst. And then here's what it looks like under ultrasound. So I think it's it's still a pretty good useful tool for following uh, renal mass renal renal masses that you're unsure of whether it's a cyst or a mass. And actually, they um, radiologists will classify using something called the Bosniak uh, classification system, where it's there's five different classes. The first two are rarely anything to follow up uh, for malignancy, but as they get more complicated, they're not just a purely thin walled fluid filled cyst, then they are tend to be operated on to because they're more than likely to be malignant. We've got a couple of pictures of a Bosniak three. We can see it's not a pure cyst. The thickness of the wall of the the cyst is much or of this mass is thicker than you'd normally see. So that's at risk of being a tumor. Bosniak four, this is the ultrasound. This is the CAT scan over here. And no matter how you cut it, it's a pretty ugly looking thing. And this is, you know, going to turn out to be a tumor. So the other thing ultrasound is used a lot for is for prostate biopsy. And its main uh, use is for guidance, not diagnosis. But we guide the needle to take samples of the prostate. And this is what the transverse view looks like. The transverse view slices like a normal loaf of bread. And we can see all these different structures and then we turn it on the side and do a sagittal and this is kind of what they're looking for is what they call a hypoechoic lesion as as higher risk of finding cancer but if anybody who does a lot of prostate ultrasound knows there's a lot of things that can look hypoechoic that are not tumors so it's really just a diagnostic tool to get good samples um ultrasound really shines in looking at scrotal um masses 
So the scrotum on ultrasound, the testicles on ultrasound look very consistent, like you see here. And then we compared to the right side, which has these kind of multifocal masses here. So you can all these, as I said, compare right to left and kind of see which, um, you know, you have the normal looking versus something that's going on here. Another thing that we use is nuclear imaging, um, commonly used for prostate cancer for looking for bony metastasis. And that's the one where you get these cute little skeletons. Um, and that's because the nuclear medicine is injected into the veins, absorbed by the body. Over time, it lights up the bony structures, lights up other things like the bladder where it's being excreted, um, other hot spots. But the big thing it's looking for is looking for areas that could be bony metastasis because it picks that up more now we had a talk a few months a few weeks ago from the pilarify folks which uses a substance that links itself to the pmsa which is highly associated with tumors so it's another way that they can do bone scans and with pet scans etc that can label these things and help to diagnose bony metastasis and now we come up to computerized tomography or CT scans. CT scans are probably the bread and butter of what we do now. And literally, it's, I always say that it's kind of like bread because it's taking slices through the body. It's looking at the body a slice at a time and it gives us a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional area. One of the things that I do want to point out or at least discuss here is the risk of radiation. It's become more common now that we're doing CAT scans. Um, and the risk of radiation, this is for what appropriate um, for using for stone disease. And it shows the relative radiation levels. And we can see as we start getting into contrast with uh, IVs, um, I mean, CTs with IV contrast, it's a higher risk of radiation. Matter of fact, they do a, a measurement in millisieverts to uh, how much radiation each of these tests has. And simple x-rays are pretty low, abdominal x-rays. But as we start getting into CT scans, that goes up significantly. And the big concern is, you know, as you're doing these uh, x-rays, multiple, you know, somebody with stones, you're probably doing multiple, if you're following with CAT scan, multiple CAT scans. Over the, the life of exposure, you could increase the risk of tumors, of cancers. Uh, especially the younger the patient, the higher the risk of early CAT scans and early radiation exposure causing tumors. So the principle that we use is something called the Alera principle, which means that we should go with as low as reasonably achievable uh, radiation exposure for patients and keep that always in mind. But the CAT scan still gives us this fantastic uh, look into the body. And here's a nice one. It's nicely labeled here. So aorta, vena cava, there's our kidneys. So we really get a, a nice view as we take slices through the body. Here's a CAT scan of a bladder. And I think that's pretty clear that that's abnormal. And that was a tumor. Again, the nice thing about CT scans is this is a pre-infusion uh, study where we can see that there's something right here. We kind of see that little bit of a... Um, markation but once you give dye what you're looking for does it enhance or not and here we can see that that mass is truly enhancing so that's highly suspicious for being a tumor again ct pre and post infusion we can see before and after with enhancement there now this is a this is one of the things i like about cat scans is you get them on a disc and you can kind of walk through the disc a almost like a movie picture and as you see as we're going through this cast again you're starting from head to toe going down and really following through so here we start to see some abdominal contents there's our pelvic bones and femur and we go through here so again we start up this is the lungs we're way up here in the lungs we're going down now we start to see the kidneys coming into view We can see some calcifications in that aorta. There's our spinal bones. And yep, and you can kind of see, this is the plain CT. We do see that mass popping out. And you can 
really trace down and see throughout the body a step at a time. You you look at CTs like that, John? Mm -hmm. All, th that's the only way to look at them contiguously yeah. and also not, not just in the uh, cross-sectional plane, but also the, uh, not just the cross-section that you're showing, but also mm -hmm. sometimes Sagitally. in a coronal plane. So yeah. the patient's facing you, and then I'm looking at it from the front to the back and back to the front. Now, I don't have any images, but then they're doing some some crazy stuff now with uh, um, almost like AI kind of pulling out structures, and it's, it's it's unbelievable what they can do with these things. Yeah, multi-planar reconstruction. Yeah, yeah can that's, do that. So here's with infusion. So now we can see the dye coming in, and there's that renal mass. I've got one here that I, I kind of, I don't think this is the one here, but again, we're going through the, the, the same way. So here we got back up the lung field here. Let's see. I think this is the one that, yeah, this is, uh, so here's our kidney with the dye. This is our delay film. So we can see the dye better in here, but watch right here. That's, that's the ureter. You can actually follow that ureter all the way down to where it enters into the bladder. There's our bladder. That's kind of neat what you can really get a lot of information and probably why CAT scans have taken over that business. Now, here comes our question. I said this is interactive. Folks out there, what are those arrows pointing at? Hmm, kind of interesting. So I'm going to show you another film, same patient. I got that circled. Okay, so now we're going to see how sophisticated our crowd is. So... Little history, this patient has both of those films. What are those previous things? Lori, are we getting any uh, takers on this one? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, were they taken at the same time or different times? No, same CT scan. Oh, we have a taker. Susie Swain said kidney. Those are kidneys, okay. Now, can you explain... That versus, I keep getting into that one. Third kidney, right? So I'm going to give you the history on this patient. This was a really interesting study. So um, first of all, these are kidneys. These are kidneys that are in renal failure. So they're, they're wiped out. This patient had uh, pyelonephritis, um, developed it in, I think he said it was in his late 20s and back then they didn't really have the antibiotics that we have nowadays and caused a lot of permanent damage actually he was told that you know he'd be lucky to see 25 i mean 35 i'm sorry he said he'd be lucky to be 35 at the time it happened well patient fortunately made it till about 50s and then he started going into having renal failure and had to go on dialysis as fate would have it he got a kidney transplant which is this kidney right here. So they don't uh, remove the previous kidneys. They just transplant this lower in the abdomen. So that's why we have this kidney view. So it's a transplanted kidney. Patient did great, except one small problem. Why he came to us. He had a stone in that uh, transplanted kidney. Now this developed long after he had the transplant, but he developed a kidney stone in it. So what would you do for that one, John? How would you treat it? Well, you can try, obviously, he only has a solitary functioning kidney. So the important thing is you want to save as many nephrons as possible. You try not to go through the actual transplant kidney. So I would highly, strongly try a retrograde approach and try to find the transplanted ureter, find the ureteral opening, which usually is fairly straightforward. But mm -hmm. depending on where the transplant surgeon implanted that ureteral op opening, uh, your access may not, it will not be the same as an orthotopic native ureteral opening. So that may be the only challenge. You just have to be a little bit more uh, careful with, because this guy has a transplanted kidney. Also, the immune compromised status of the patient often plays a role in taking care of the patient and making sure that he does okay. We, we have a question um, yeah. from Susie. Is the stone non-obstructing? Uh, was not obstructing. You're correct. It's just floating in there. It's not causing obstruction. Didn't drop into the ureter. 
but that's of course that's potential as it could and that's as john pointed out this is only kidney so what did we end up doing and i, I can tell you this was early on when shockwave uh, lithotripsy was just starting to come out and i don't know that there was a lot of papers out there as, of whether you could shockwave uh transplant a kidney but you can because that's what we did it was a shockwave on it now interesting john had mentioned about trying to go up uh through the transplanted ureter when we looked in cystoscopically we also found he had a couple of stones in the bladder one of the stones was actually attached to the suture that was used to suture in the uh stent so that was pretty easily treated by just cutting that stitch loose. Um, but the uh, the shockwave was a success. Patient was stone free and kind of an interesting. Sometimes some of the things you'll see on a CAT scan. Now, I have to add to the story that this particular patient was my dad. So I had kind of a, a, a bit of a influence in all these decisions. It was kind of tough when you're looking at taking care of your own father. But uh, yeah, my uh one of our urologists did a great job in looking into all that. When did he have, a, a, what year did he have the shockwave? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Gosh, time is- You said well, early on, right? It, it was, was early shockwave. on. It was it was the the tub. He had to oh, be so he actually, uh, that's exactly what I was trying to get to. So he had a shockwave lithotripsy done in the 1980s, in yeah. the late 80s, most likely. And the problem with the HM3, uh, it's the original OG shockwave machine. The patient is hoisted into a bath so that we can perform the procedure. The, yeah. the problem with the HM3, highly effective, but the, the, the issue is that the focal zone, the, the energy delivery area is quite large. So mm -hmm. there's always worry about fracturing the kidney, damage to the adjacent structures. I, I just don't see that anymore with the new machines. But yeah, the HM3 was always always a concern. That's why it, it, there's there's always that theoretical risk of renal injury when you do shockwave lithotripsy, and it, when it's in the old days, I, like I guess you didn't know. We didn't have data about the safety of shockwave using an HM3 on a transplanted kidney, and I yeah. think that's when it was. Unfortunately, it worked out well for your dad. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a a, a gut check to you know what to do. You know, we, you finally get this good kidney, and now what? We have another question from Susie. She wants to know if ESWL is safer than a laser litho on a transplanted kidney. So um, I, don't, I don't have any. I don't have any data. I do not know yeah. of a study that specifically looked at that. And I'm sure there are papers out there regarding the safety of the of shockwave lithotripsy on a transplanted kidney for kidney stones. Yeah, especially with the newer machines. Like I said, at the time this happened, there wasn't a lot of good data out there. And there was, you know, what's our best approach? Do we try to, you know, go up ureteroscopically and try to get the stone? And it was it was not an easy, uh, you know, access because, as John said, those ureters are not trans are not implanted the same as the normal ureters are. So fortunately, it worked out. I give the urologist a lot of credit who took care of them. Uh, and our last thing we're going to talk about is magnetic resonance imaging the mri um the nice thing about mri and i probably didn't mention it when i was talking about cat scans but the infusion is the same as for the ivp it's it's uh x-ray dye it's i it's iodine so you have to worry again about allergies to it you have to worry about the uh, uh renal function again if you don't have good renal function you're giving dye so that's where the mri comes in it does not use a nephrotoxic diet uses gadolidium for its uh, contrast media. And with the uh, MRI, the, the big concern is implanted uh, metals. So if you have something that's got metallic implant, you know, a, a knee implant or something, um, you may not be a candidate for an MRI. Now, some of the implants are MRI safe. So they uh, it, you have to always check to see if you had an implant, whether it is or not. But uh, other than that, it's the magnetic uh, effect that you have to be concerned about. Now, one of the things that um, is different with the MRIs, as I mentioned with the CAT scan, things that are liquid show up clear and things that are bony show up white. With the MRI, if it's it, they have two different weighting systems, a T1 and T2 weighting to the images. So T1 weighted images, fat appears bright while water and bone appear dark. And on T2 images, 
things that contain water appear bright while fat is relatively dark. So it's kind of a little different look, but the images are very similar to what we see in a CAT scan. So we have our, our sagittal cut through, and then we have our transverse cuts through the, and we can kind of see the, the outlines. MRI is more sensitive, I think, for the soft tissues, so we get a better image. Um, they're not as fast as CT scans, so CT scans still get the uh, nudge towards doing quick studies. So this is done, takes longer to do. As somebody who's had multiple MRIs in his life, I can tell you they're long studies. Um, but anyway, that's what we're able to see with the MRI, just keeping in mind you have to know if it's a T1 or T2 weighted study. And with that, I'm going to give you one more recommendation. If you're interested in learning more about x-rays and how to read them and, or imaging in general, visit this site called radiopedia.org. Kind of leaving it up on the screen for a little bit here so you can write it down. It's a really great site. I think we've got enough time. I'm going to actually show you that site because it's, it's uh, pretty interesting. And as I switch over, because we'll be able to do our Q&A here. I'm going to... Well, while you're switching, Vic, I just yeah. want to say excellent job on presenting this topic. It's complex. And how you went through the normal anatomy first and then go, went through the different imaging modalities. Uh, very nicely done. Thank you. All right. So here, I did want to share this. Let me see. I want to bring up. Oh, here it is. There. Make that big. It has. It's a great. It's a great resource. Except it's got a lot of commercials in it, so I will warn you about that. But uh, anyway, you can just look for whatever you're looking for. So here, I'm looking for renal mass, and it'll give you different uh, articles about it, but it has a lot of these films that you can look at yourself. So here's a left renal mass with renal vein invasion, and it talks through the case. And if you click on it, what's nice is you can go here and look at these actual, uh, these commercials drive me nuts. Here we go. You can actually thumb through the scan, just like I was showing before. And you can find all sorts of scans to look at. And then as we talked about the coronal views. So pretty easy to see that on the left side, that big, you know, compared to the right, that big ugly looking mass. But anyway, that's, that's the, let's stop my sharing here. And let me pull my second camera offline. There we go. All right. So that's a great site, that Radiopedia. I don't know if, if any of you guys have looked at that one before or or not. Or, but No, I have not looked at it. But one yeah. of the, this is off topic. One of the ways to try to decrease or eliminate those pop-up ads is by installing, I think Chrome has an extension for sure called App Blocker. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it drives you nuts when you're trying to go through it because it keeps popping all these ads everywhere. And of course, that's it's free. I mean, there are some courses you can actually take, so they do charge for that. But overall, it's not uh, a charge system. So I, I figure, well, I can deal with their ads. But that's a good idea, ad blocker for that. So, all right. Well, do we have any questions out there, Lori? Um, I do. I mean... I I have a question because I know that MRI of the prostate is pretty big right now. And I wanted, I was just curious to see how many people are using it and how many people are getting success as far as, you know, we use the Pyrad system with the three T, the three Tesla MRI. Um, and we did actually a little study kind of internally in our office on the MRIs um, as far as their Pyrad versus whether they had cancer or not or what their grade was. And, and believe it or not, I mean, it's been pretty consistent. It's actually a really good MRI to look for lesions. Mm -hmm. But we have found ones that say they're pyrads fives and their biopsies come back negative. And it's pretty interesting. Yeah. 
I, I think none of these are perfect, but you know, I talked a little bit about ultrasound of the prostate, and I, I can tell you anything that you look at an ultrasound and say that's a suspicious lesion, it, it's almost a roll of the dice as to whether it comes back positive or not. Yeah, really Susie not. says they use MRI a lot. I think it's pretty big everywhere now. I think that, that that's going to be a, a, a really good discussion for somebody to talk maybe in the future for your own nurse is, you know, how you, you know, take a, a patient who walks in with an elevated PSA and how do you follow that? Because I can tell you 40, you know, not quite 40 years ago, but in, up until probably the last decade, it was pretty, you know, much the, 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 the routine elevated PSA, abnormal DRE, you're on the table biopsy. for a biopsy, <laughs> guaranteed. And that's not the case anymore. Yeah. So now it's elevated PSA. There's other tests that we can do, genetic testing to see whether it's the, your high risk. You know, one of the things I think we learned from the our tradition as urology was that operating on these three plus three Gleason prostates was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's that they behave so much like a normal, you know, a non-cancerous lesion that really they should have been just followed instead of putting patients through the operations or the radiation and all the side effects that come along with that. So I think, you know, it's, as John said, just don't fall back on tradition, but learn from tradition, things that we've found in our past that we need to change. But then, you know, like I said, genetic testing, and then um, as you mentioned, MRI has really come in the, the forefront where those lesions have a high risk of being cancer when they're positive. And the plus is that you can then use that as a localizing agent so that you can aim right to that lesion and get those uh, biopsies. Yeah, the them. MRI fusion biopsies for sure. Yep. And we've been doing those in our office. I don't know. Do you do those, John? Or I do use MRI in targeting prostate cancer for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it is helpful, especially when you have someone with just an elevated PSA, normal rectal examination, then do you biopsy? Do you not biopsy? Do you just check another PSA? Do you get an ISO PSA, 4K score? What do you do next? And this, the MRI, prostate MRI has uh, really helped in trying to figure out what is the best next thing to do. But just like any imaging study, it is interpreted by a human and there yeah. is some subjectivity when it comes to coming up with the PIRAD score. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, so any, anybody out there wants to volunteer to give a talk on this, I'd love to have it because I think that's going to be interesting to, to navigate through to how, you know, especially with uh, the, all these changes and trying to keep track of all these genetic tests. Uh, the good old days were a lot easier, that's for sure. But <laughs> nowadays, it's, it's nice to know that if you have an elevated PSA, you're not going right straight Portion to the table. biopsies. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember that's what you did. And the half hour day was filled with prostate biopsies. And, you know, now you get, you know, you get one positive biopsy out of 15 biopsies. And now you're getting a positive biopsy almost every time they biopsy just based on MRI. So it's pretty neat. Yeah, we're certainly a lot more selective on whom we biopsy because there's always that small risk of about 3% chance of becoming septic infection is the mm -hmm. number one thing that I worry about when you do a transrectal biopsy. There yeah. are other techniques now that are coming to the fore, such as transperineal prostate biopsies. So That's all we do now is transperineals. Yeah. We don't do any office biopsies anymore. Ah, so yeah. So the cost of doing this biopsy has now greatly increased because you're doing it in the operating room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So more reason to be highly selective about who you're bringing in. Right. Just for the influence on society, you know, the cost of doing this. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about the 3% risk of sepsis. Let me tell you, if I'm the patient and I get septic, that's 100% risk. That's right. Yeah. I always uh, go back to, you know, when patients will ask the question, is this a minor procedure? I go, well, I said, <laughs> it's a minor procedure if it's you. I said, if it's me, I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> it becomes major. Yeah. 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 And I always look at things that way. I think that, you know, keep it in mind, you know, um, putting somebody on at, at any kind of risk is still a risk. And if you don't have to, and especially, like I said, we looked at the other side of it, 
are we overdiagnosing prostate cancer? And certainly in the past, that was the case. Overdiagnosing, overtreating. You know, when you tell somebody that they have cancer, their world changes. And I think that being able to say, you know, you're at a low risk for this being cancer and we'll just keep an eye on it. And not, not to be ignored. I mean, I think you have to have the right patient. You don't want somebody to come back 10 years later and say, well, you know, I thought I had low risk. So and find out it wasn't the case. We well, Vic, Vic and Lori, you and we all have been around long enough to remember that active surveillance wasn't even a phrase. It wasn't. No. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> nope. And we, I've seen a lot of patients that have been on active, active surveillance for the past decade. And all those patients who had the you know, open radical prostatectomy with all the side effects and everything that probably could have just gone on active surveillance. It's crazy. Yeah. The trials and advances and the learning with medicine, right? That's why they call it a practice. Yeah. 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 Well, it's great. I, I hope this, uh, I think it was Susie Swain who actually asked for the imaging study. Now Susie's in the audience. So I hope I covered everything you were looking to hear about radiology. Um, I'm by far no expert, but I've had a lot of experience. I was fortunate enough when I uh, first got into urology that uh, back in those days, we were looking at real films. And so the morning, every morning I made rounds in the hospital with one of our urologists. And my job was to get the films together and start going over all the films and get them in order. And, and of course, our film viewing area was right next to radiology. So all the radiologists were sitting in the back. And I'd go, hey, come over here. Give me a, <laughs> give me a, a second here. Tell me what you see. And so I always had the chance to kind of review these things and learn how to read films. And it was kind of a, a nice thing to learn, I think. Susie said thank you. And thank you, Susie, for the topic. It was great. Yeah, yeah, I think that this was a great. And again, that's what part of what we want to do here is bring you what you're asking to learn more about. So we got plenty of things. And Cheryl um, mentioned that uh, they are using MRI along with the biopsy for a fuller picture of the uh, diagnosis. That's good. Yeah, yeah, definitely some area to talk about. Hey, Lori, that might be a good one for you to give us a talk on transperineal biopsy. I could work on that. <laughs> yeah. Give me some time because I'm not in the OR with them. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing it, but at least you're seeing the patients post-op, see how that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. But uh, I think that it is definitely an attractive alternative because the sepsis rate is so much lower. It sure is. Uh, yeah. Well, if we don't have any questions, I have no problem with getting on to the day. It's a cold one here in the Chicagoland area. It's only in the 40s. Uh, and I think some of you know that I mentioned I have a boat. My boat's still in the water. And oh, I'm boy. starting to think about now is about the time to put the boat in the garage. So I'm going to start looking at getting my boat to, <laughs> on, on land and on the in the garage. Because, man, when it's in the 40s and 50s, it's no fun to be out on a boat. So, Well, John, I hope your talk goes really well. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead here and bring up the next week's uh, talk is going to be one of our skills. Uh, Lace Heidelman, who's one of our uh, experts here, is going to be presenting on BCG. I've got my commercial. BCG, or Bacillus calmet garin, is a widely used immunotherapy for the prevention of recurrent bladder cancer. In this context, BCG is not a vaccine but rather a treatment that harnesses the body's immune system to fight cancer cells. BCG therapy has been a significant advancement in the management of recurrent bladder cancer. It can help reduce the likelihood of cancer returning and progressing to a more invasive stage. However, the treatment may have side effects, such as urinary symptoms, fever, and fatigue. To learn more be sure to check out episode 63 on Euronurse.com. All right. Well, be sure to join us next week for that great talk on BCG. I think there's plenty to always learn about BCG, and it's especially aimed at those that are new to urology. So our MAs and our RNs that are new to the field, learn about what you should be doing when you're giving this and what need, precautions need to be taken. And for the rest of you, have a great weekend, and we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, everyone.